Hey, everybody, we got a great one today, you know, for a change. And this time, this time, I mean it, Alex Gibney, Academy Award winning documentarian, also Emmy winning and many, many other awards in his long distinguished career. His latest on HBO is The Crime of the Century. And of course, we're talking about Biden stealing the election. I thought we'd just finally get another point of view on that. No, no, it isn't. It's it's about, uh, unfortunately, about opioids. Over 500,000 Americans dead. A very sordid tale about the pharmaceutical industry, particularly Purdue Pharma, founded by the Sackler family, who do not come off well, to say the least. But it's a story with a lot of bad actors, including Rudy Giuliani who represented the pharmaceutical industry during a very crucial period that led to a settlement, a settlement that buried a lot of the worst practices that created this crime that left so many Americans dead. Some regulators look bad, doctors not so good, many of them. A few politicians, Marsha Blackburn, now senator from Tennessee, very bad. It is fascinating. Um, A lot going on up on the Hill this week. Democrats in Congress overwhelmingly are for allowing Medicare to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies to bring down prices. I wrote a bill to do just that several years ago. The uh, Republicans were in the majority at the time in the Senate, and my bill really had nowhere to go. And by the way, the pharmaceutical industry is far more profitable than the insurance industry. In 2018, for example, the top five pharmaceutical companies had a profit margin of 19.4%. The top profit margin for for for-profit insurance companies was 6% and 3% for non-profit insurance companies. That's in Actually, no small part because of a provision that I wrote into the Affordable Care Act called the medical loss ratio, which said that health insurance companies have to spend at least 80% of their premiums on actual health care, not on administrative costs, executive salaries, and marketing. That's for small group policies, 80%, 85% for large group policies. And if they don't hit that medical loss ratio, they have to refund the difference to their policyholders, and Americans have gotten billions of dollars back, and the insurance companies have been forced to become far more efficient. Now, three Democrats voted against allowing Medicare to negotiate with the pharmaceuticals, killing it in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Scott Peters of California, Kurt Schrader of Oregon, and Kathleen Rice of New York. If you're in one of their districts, please give their office a call and give them hell. Um, There's another big development uh, in, in Congress this week. Senate Democrats have come to an agreement on a very good voting rights bill. Amy Klobuchar and Joe Manchin and several other Senate Democrats have produced the Freedom to Vote Act and includes a lot of very important provisions that safeguard the right to vote and the integrity of future federal elections. Uh, a lot of important provisions from the House, which had passed the uh, For the People Act, and important provisions from uh, Senator Raphael Warnock's Preventing Election Subversion Act, which is designed to counter provisions in in laws passed in in Georgia and Texas that would allow partisans to overturn elections. And it protects election officials from being uh, replaced for partisan purposes. It protects poll workers by making intimidation of poll workers a felony. It overrides local voter suppression laws that we've uh, seen passing in 18 states. It makes Election Day a national holiday which it most definitely should be, so that working isn't a barrier to voting. It enables voters to request mail-in ballots. It addresses these massive efforts in states like Georgia to purge voters from the voting rolls. It allows for election day registration. Your in-state driver's license automatically uh, gets you registered. And 
there's finally a disclosure piece to this bill, which would end dark money in campaigns, which is absolutely crucial to restoring fairness in our democracy and in our economy. There's just a whole bunch of great things in this bill. Uh, the question is, can Democrats get 10 Republicans to vote for this, which brings us to the filibuster. I've talked about this before. First, you could carve out voting rights as being so fundamental to our democracy that it should only be held to a 51-vote threshold. Would would Manchin and, and Cinema go for that? Let, let's see what happens when Joe Manchin tries to get 10 of his Republican friends uh, to vote for this bill. Watch Mitch give him Collins and Murkowski. Well, it was bipartisan. I didn't stop anyone from voting for it. There's also the uh, filibuster modification that Norm Ornstein and I have talked about that Manchin says he's open to. Now, you've heard me talk about this before. Basically, what it would do, first of all, it would put the burden on the people who are filibustering. So instead of Democrats having to come up, in this case, Democrats, with 60 votes to stop a filibuster, Republicans, in this case, would have to come up with 41 votes to sustain a filibuster, and they'd have to come to the floor. 41 Republicans would have to be on the floor and stay there. But they could, some could leave and others come in, but at all times they have to have 41. And, and a talking filibuster means they have to debate. They, and, and what they're saying has to be germane. It's no green eggs and ham like Ted Cruz did when he did a fake filibuster. And, and that would be good. You would get a debate on things like, uh, really, why, why is it illegal? Why should it be illegal to give water to someone in line who's voting? And I've talked about this before, but I, I've gotten uh, pushback on this. Uh, from people, uh, letters and stuff. Uh, one guy said, well, you know, electioneering is illegal. And if you if you are allowed to give water to someone in line, that would give you access to them, and then you could electioneer. Okay, well, here's a couple things. First of all, yeah, you also it's illegal to kneecap someone. If you gave someone water, if you, you could... Have and then have access to kneecap them, but it's still illegal. Also, and this is the main point: electioneering is illegal, like two hundred feet from the polls. It's not illegal a half a mile from the polls or three blocks from the polls. It's just illegal in the last two hundred feet. It, it varies by state, but that's usually it's two hundred feet. 200 feet from the poll. You don't need water then. You're about to go to the polls. So when you need the water is when you're in line for eight hours. That's when you need the water. So um, for those of you who have written on, in on this, don't be so stupid, please. That's all I ask. All right. Well, we got Alex Gibney coming up. This really is... A very important and very fascinating and disturbing story. And he's really good at explaining it and explaining the history of this. And has it has quite a history. You are going to really, really enjoy this one. You know, for a change. Have you ever won an award for your documentaries? Mm, I have. Uh -huh. I have. So you're an award-winning documentarian. Documentarian, that's correct. Okay, so I should include that. We're talking about the crime of the century, uh, the documentary. <laughs> and, and is that this century, would you say? Yeah, I'd yeah. say it's this century. There were some big ones last century. That's right, but we're getting some big ones now this century. It's true. It's, it's, it's tough to keep track. It's the reigning crime of the century for the moment. I can't guarantee that it'll stay at the top of the pack for, for long, given that, uh, how, how we're doing. 
let's start at the start, which is before the century, right? I mean, we're talking about opium and uh, pain, the painkillers and drugs that uh, have been around for a while, right? For a long time. I mean, one of the things I, I, I did in the, in the opening title sequence was to go back to the days of Egypt, uh, that is to say, ancient Egypt, pyramids and all, Alexander the Great, and, and sort of trace the use of opium through the opium wars, uh, use industrial revolution, you know, both legal and illegal, uh, all the way up to the present. And opium as a, as a commodity has been around for a long time. In 1848, I believe it balanced world trade. That is to say, China had everything it wanted. And, and so we, there was an enormous imbalance of trade. We only had one thing that China seemed to want, which was opium. And so we, uh, we, that is to say, the Americans and ultimately the British, ruthlessly uh, pushed opium on China, uh, uh, which uh, when their drugs are dumped a bunch of opium balls into the ocean, caused the Opium War, which is how the British took control of Hong Kong. It's funny because I, when I was a little kid, I used to hear things like Opium Wars or like the Spice Wars, right? And I right. think like, do people really like cinnamon that much? <laughs> <laughs> that they're willing to go to war. And I'm five at this time, so yeah. I'm not thinking clearly. But opium wars was, it, it's all it's about money, right? Yep. Is that, yeah. And this was about money, this, this crime. Yeah, it was. The British East India Company was running a massive trade. They were growing opium in India in factories and then shipping it to China and making bank. And, and so, yes, it was about a massive amount of money. And and like I said, it balanced world trade at the time. Our balance of trade is quite good because <laughs> of the opium we're sending to China. We're very proud of that. Yeah, there Why were Scottish we, traders. I think you're going English. They were Scottish traders, Jardine and, and Matheson, oh, I, I believe. I don't were. think I can do Scott. That's not Scott. That's I, that's not even Sean Connery. I don't know what that is. But anyway, the point is, is that it was a commodity, a huge commodity, an important worldwide commodity. And that's about, uh, we're talking about money. The Crime of the Century, your documentary, is about money too, right? Indeed it is. It's, it's about how first a, a number of drug companies really revived the practice of, of pushing opium as you know, aggressively as possible in the uh, late 1990s um, and then into the 2000s. And, and, and I would say you, you'd have to say that the effort was spearheaded by the Purdue Corporation, which is um, owned by members of the Sackler family, who have become somewhat infamous in, in, in recent days, but they right. they came up with a they they came up with a product called OxyContin, which is basically mm -hmm. time release oxycodone, and oxycodone is something that's about double the potency of morphine, um, and the money making idea was it was actually a very good drug for end-of-life cancer patients who mm -hmm. didn't matter whether they got addicted or not, because that's the one thing we should point out. It's been known for hundreds, if not thousands of years, that opium is very addictive. So anyway, they, they, it was a good medicine for uh, end-of-life cancer patients. And, and obviously, oxycodone, without the time releases, was a good medicine you know, after an operation. But what the Purdue company did was to come up with a kind of uh, advertising campaign that tried to convince people that it wasn't really that addictive. And right. so long as you took it in this time release form, you could take as much as you wanted. And th th their slogan came to be the one to start with and the one to stay with. And stay with and stay with and f more frequently. So it is, is an active ingredient in it? What, what is the active ingredient, the oxy part? Oxycodone. So it, oxycontin, contin refers to the time release mechanism. In other words, it, you take the pill and you release it slowly in your body. Oxycodone is the opiate. It's a kind of... Um, and it is an opiate. Yes. It's definitely an opiate, hence uh, opioids. Yep. I see, I see. Now, uh, so this time release, did they? how did they get... The FDA, how did they get others to sort of sign off and say, yep, that's what it is. It's time released, and that's why it isn't addictive. How did that happen? Well, it turns out, and this was one of the documents that we uncovered in doing the documentary, 
it turned out that there was a rather unholy alliance with uh, an individual who worked at the FDA, who in fact sat down with members of the Purdue company for three days. And literally, uh, the Purdue company wrote this person, his name was Curtis Wright. Uh, he was supposed to uh, comment on the application by Purdue. And <laughs> lo and behold, for three days, Purdue helped him write those comments uh, on Purdue's own application. And not surprisingly, it ended up being very favorable to Purdue. And they were allowed to put in the so-called package insert, that thing that goes along with the bottle of pills that you would get, a notice saying that, uh, you know, in its time release form, it's believed to be relatively non-addictive. I'm not quoting it precisely, but, Mm -hmm. but that was the idea. So that then their marketing people could run with that wherever they went. And, and market that, that to doctors, obviously. Is there a revolving door involved there? There Did, was. Yes. There was a, a revolving door. And about um, a year or so after he leaves the FDA, lo and behold, he walks through that revolving door right back into a job at Purdue, where he's paid the equivalent of about $370,000. Quid pro quo, as they say. Well, that's a big problem in Washington, of course, is that people go from industry to regulatory agencies and regulatory agencies to industry. And you know that if you decide things in favor of a business that's say uh, uh, Boeing or something like that, well, you got a job at Boeing. Or if you decide something in favor of Comcast when you're at the FCC, uh, why? You might get a job at Comcast when you leave the FCC. So this is a big, big, big problem. Curtis Rice, is he still around? Is this guy still around? Curtis Wright is still around, and uh, but we... Did he, he enjoy he the film? For some reason, he didn't want to talk to us. Really? Yeah, that is shocking, I know. My God, you think he'd want to defend the scurrilous Yeah, charges. well, we did approach him. We asked him to comment, but he didn't seem interested. Well, uh, but might have been but his, his name was uncovered by... You know, it might have been his rig- weight. Like, he might have been like, I've gained some weight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be on the, camera. That could be. Yeah. The, 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 you never the, know what the real reason is, you know. We we can work with people, though. Sometimes with makeup and stuff like that, you can look... Yeah, look at Brando in Apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they did that. Exactly. So he didn't want to talk to you. Did uh, Was that a problem? <laughs> how, how many of the Sacklers talked to you? Zero. And you won't be surprised to learn that all the politicians who are implicated in this story didn't really want to talk to us either. Well, in a way, every member of Congress is implicated in it, including that's, me, that's I guess. Uh, by the time we get to the end, but there were some, there were some that there were a little bit more. Well, let me explain that before leaning. we. Let me explain that before we go. Uh, there was a it's 2016. Marsha Blackburn introduced a bill that really made it harder for. Uh, it made it much more difficult for the DEA to go after companies that were seemingly, knowingly providing drugs for pill mills, you know, so, so what the DEA would do if they saw suspicious orders, they could shut down the company immediately and say, stop until we investigate. But this bill, you know, prevented them from doing that, which meant that, that, that they really couldn't prevent, you know, massive companies, massive drug distributors from supplying incredible amounts of opioids in to, to communities that were obviously not using them for knee pain or even end of life cancer pain. It was, they were clearly being diverted to a black market. Uses. Let's talk about this piece of legislation and what I'm talking about of my culpability, because this was, this bill was passed by unanimous consent in both the house and the Senate and signed Correct. by, by President Obama. And it was the Controlled Substance Act, right? It was a, an amendment, I believe, to the Controlled Substances Act. It was the Ensuring Patient Access and Enforcement. I don't know, it was a very long name. It basically, the burden to require uh, that uh, a drug d- uh, demonstrated harm was, was made, the burden was lowered. <laughs> and because uh, I think the language was a substantial likelihood of immediate threat of death and bodily harm. The phrase imminent harm was replaced by immediate harm. In other words, oh, you yes. had to prove that there was going to be immediate harm and there was no death. way to do that. So you couldn't you, you you couldn't shut down the supply in ways that they used to do if 
they had discovered that 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 these drugs were being inappropriate. But it also sold. actually mentioned death, an immediate threat yeah, that's of right. death. That's right. And so I can see where a lot of bills go through with the unanimous consent and a lot of people. And, you know, Marsha Blackburn must have paid attention to it if she introduced it. And I understand DEA officials warned her about this. Former DEA officials. Former DEA officials, yeah. But also, didn't a former DEA official say that he had warned her staffers about Well, he what warned this her publicly. He, uh, uh, there's a guy named Joe Renazizi that testified publicly uh, about the danger of the bill and then was kind of drummed out of the DEA because he told members of Congress, namely Marsha Blackburn and another gentleman named Tom Marino from Pennsylvania. It, wasn't he nominated by Trump to be the... Uh, the drug czar. The drug czar, but then he kind of got the heave-ho, right? He got the heave-ho. There was a lot of pushback. <laughs> I think <laughs> and, Joe Manchin kind of led that heave-ho, as I recall. Tom Marino never did serve as the drug czar, but he was the first person nominated by then-President Trump to serve in that capacity, even though he's the guy for whom that this bill that we're talking about was named. And it was a very short bill. I mean, it was just an amendment. It was a three-pager that was really just a very surgical replacement of imminent with immediate which meant all the difference in the world. And that little change was well known because this former person from the DEA knew exactly how to craft it. And as, as you know better than I, you know, many of these bills are not written by the offices of the Congress people. They're written by lobbyists and then simply sure. approved by the uh, sponsoring congressperson. So that's what happened. And yeah, it was passed by unanimous consent. Nobody... I, it, it's unclear whether anybody even read it. I, I'm sure I didn't. I mean, I'm sure I didn't. Uh, again, this is an amendment to a, probably a, a, a huge bill, yep. and it just didn't, you know, get to the level of hey, hey, hey. And you know what? Threat of death being put in there while there's an opioid crisis, you could go like, oh, good, they put in threat of death. In this. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, good for them. Yeah. Thank God. Right. Somebody's right. saying there's a threat of death. Which and but it has the opposite effect, which is saying it needed to have an immediate threat of death in order to be looked at by that's right uh, by the DA. Okay, uh, I just that's a process thing that I think even people watching the film, I'm not sure uh, they understand that how something gets through like that without people flagging it at the time. A lot of stuff gets through where only sometimes years later you find out, oh crap. That shouldn't have been in there. And sometimes That's right. the intention wasn't terrible. But anyway, this this one, I have to think that Marsha Blackburn got contributions from the pharma, uh, from pharmaceuticals. She did indeed. Yeah. And uh, she did indeed. And so did Tom Marino. You know, you know, you, let me say one, let me uh, add that. You do know it if you wrote the bill. I mean, if it's your bill, if you're introducing it, you, you should know everything in, in that. That's right. So I put this squarely on Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee when she was in the House then. Now she's a senator. And uh, this guy, Marino? Marino? Tom Marino, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. Okay, so let's start it. Let's start it with, let's uh, start with Purdue and the Sacklers, shall we? Sure. The Sacklers, so the Sacklers I mean. The, They're a Shonda the, for the Goyam, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what that means <laughs> uh, is it, an embarrassment for the Jews because they're Jewish people, and uh, it's they're in the Roy Cohn area, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it, it's bad. What they did was bad, and they very much knew the damage that they were doing because it was referred OxyContin. We discovered depositions by people within Purdue Pharma, which was the Sacklers company. Um, talking about how they used to joke about OxyContin, uh, calling it hillbilly heroin inside the uh, office. Boy, that kind of stuck, didn't it? Good for you. <laughs> you coined something before it was coined. Good for you guys in Purdue. <laughs> Jesus. And Yeah. So, so, so they knew very well that it was being abused. It was being abused massively. And there were lots of people all over the country that were begging them to uh, do something about it, to both do something about their marketing campaigns 
and also to do something about the drug itself that, that might cause it to be a little bit less potent. Because that's the thing about it was these drugs were very much desired on the street. There was one, I think the, the morphine version was called a purple peeler. They were very much desired on the street because if you all you had to do was crush them and that would take away the time release. And then what was buried beneath was a massive dose of oxycodone which you could then snort or you could dissolve it into a spoon and inject. And so it was, it was having a massive effect on, uh, on addiction, and particularly in communities um, like Virginia or West Virginia uh, or parts of Ohio or Maine and basically all over. There were a few states which had much stricter regulations about how and when you could prescribe opioids, and those states tended not to be as badly hit. Imagine that. That 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 regulations <laughs> actually benefited the public Protect in a way that, that would prevent um, massive abuse. Uh, but that is in the, that is the fact. And and Purdue would focus their marketing muscle on those states that didn't have those protections because that ended up being much more profitable. Okay, let's talk about marketing. Let's talk about their marketing practices. And then in the the second doc is a lot about insys. Yes. Which, uh, what was their product? Their product was a product called Subsys, which was a spray under the tongue fentanyl. Now, fentanyl, fentanyl is incredibly more powerful than, than any, oxycodone, yeah, 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 or heroin, right? It, it, it's uh, something like fifty to one hundred times more powerful. So, Insys had a spray which was being marketed by their um, people, and they had a system of kind of kickbacks. Is basically what it was, where they would go and basically bribe doctors to prescribe large amounts of this drug. Uh, and the more they prescribed, the more kickback money they received in the form of so-called speaker fees, um, which was a, a practice, by the way, that, that Purdue had kind of initiated. And, and Insys was a company that was just taking this practice. Uh, you so know, you'd be a doctor and you go to some doctor's conference and talk about their drug and, and pray, you know, and talk about how great it was. Right. Is that, well, it, 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 it wasn't even that high a bar. Basically what you would do is you'd go out to dinner with an insta oh, salesman right. yeah. and the instant salesman would say, so what do you think about our drug? You like it? And the, and the doctor would say, yeah, I really like it. I said, great. You, you, you've done a great job for our speakers program. And then they would pay the doctor. Um, oh, I see. But, but so they had it a, was, I see. It, you didn't have to get in the plane and fly to Florida. No, <laughs> no you just had to go out to conference. dinner or maybe go to a strip club with a member of uh, the Insta sales. Sometimes, place. though, hey, to be fair, sometimes it was dinner and a strip club. That's right. That's right. Some, <laughs> it just depended. It all depended on, um, on, on what it took on to what make the eth- sale. On, on your ethics as a doctor. No, I'm not going to a strip club. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was that blatant. In fact, uh, the, there was a guy we talked to who was, has been convicted and, and I believe is actually now in prison. There was some delay because of COVID. But his name is Alec Berlikoff. And Alec was a very useful witness both for the prosecution. He ultimately flipped and and uh, told tales on behalf of the prosecution. But also was yeah, he's in a very compelling and... witness for us. Yeah, yeah. Because he's, he's something right out of Glenn Gary. Glenn Ross. I mean, always be closing, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And he would classify doctors according to colors, red, blue, green, and yellow, I think. And it was the reds he were after, the businessmen who were so busy that they just wanted to know, like, how can you cross my palm with cash? They wouldn't bother with the other doctors because it was too hard to make the sale. They might actually ask for things like, was this drug effective? And what did I need to do? The other doctors were much more transactional. So there's a thing called pill mills. Yep. Tell me about those. So a pill mill is basically a setup whereby you have a doctor who's willing to write prescriptions for pills that aren't really needed for pain and sometimes has as part of the operation a fulfillment mechanism whereby you can take the script that you pay for from the doctor and then get it filled at his place, you know, or you go to the local CVS. Um, 
And these were pill mills where, where basically you're abusing the prescription process in order to get pills that aren't really for pain, therefore zoning out, therefore um, abuse. So that's what they were. Is the doctor the pill mill or is the CVS Sometimes, there? Usually the doctor, the doctor has to play a role because you need a prescription, right? So usually a doctor is part of a pill mill. But what about the pharmacy? Are there pharmacies that... Definitely. Uh, Par- pharmacies that, what that, they're that, doing? That, that, that don't ask any questions. In fact, we profiled... Um, you know, w- w- One of the people that we profiled in the film was a former DEA official named Joe Renazizi. And Joe described an operation in Florida where there was a CVS and one of his undercover agents went in and said, geez, we noticed that people are lining up at your CVS at five o'clock in the morning in order to be able to get OxyContin. This seems to me to be a problem. And the person said, well, look, don't worry. We cut off the sale of OxyContin to those people at around two o'clock so that we can give medicine to the people who really need it. That was a jaw dropper. You, you talk about this, uh, the guy who was in, in the film uh, being in prison. Uh, a number of people are in prison. Are any of those doctors in prison that did yeah. this? Are any of the uh, phar- pharmacists who did this? Or who's in prison? Yeah, I, I think that the DEA did put a number of doctors and or you know, uh, federal agencies and sometimes state agencies did put a number of doctors and some pharmacists in prison. I think the problem was that it was excruciatingly rare for the large businessmen and large corporations that were really fueling this process to be ever held to account. Now, the executive at Insys, John Kapoor, who's the guy who ran the company, he was convicted and he's serving, mm, I believe it's four years in prison. And we also profile another guy who's kind of like the Walter White of our story, a guy named Caleb Lanier, Uh, who kind of exemplifies... He's a guy who got addicted. He got addicted because he had a really bad injury, and he needed OxyContin for pain. So he got addicted, but when he got addicted, he needed more and more of the drug, and it was either becoming harder to persuade doctors to increase the dosage, or it was too expensive. And so Caleb turned to heroin. Heroin turned out to be too expensive for him, so he ultimately learned that he could order fentanyl via FedEx from China, and it would just be sent to him. And fentanyl was so powerful that he could cut it and then support his habit and also make a rather handsome living by selling it. So he became a fentanyl dealer in Lubbock, Texas, until federal agents caught wind of what he was doing and ultimately arrested him. And it was very Walter White because he had like he had a lab there, right? In his he had his own lab. He was he was cooking his own fentanyl. When the federal agents raided his lab, they did so with hazmat suits because fentanyl is so powerful yep. that if you get too much much of it on your skin, you can overdose. So they they were they were deeply concerned. You know the. A lot of the agents, and, and, and we did get some rather nice cooperation from some of the DEA uh, and, and also Homeland Security folks. They would do investigations into overdoses, and very often they would find people you know, still holding the fentanyl pipe in their hands. Uh, they wouldn't have dropped it by the time they expired because the, the rush uh, and resulting death was so instantaneous that, because the drug was so powerful. Where are we now, just in terms of this epidemic? Has it peaked? Well, it it increased rather massively during, I mean, uh, opioid overdoses increased substantially during um, COVID. COVID. And, and, And a lot of people, you know, critics who say, well, you know, you can't blame prescription opioids or, you know, the Sacklers would say this, you can't blame OxyContin for this opioid crisis, because a lot of the people now are dying of fentanyl. And that part is true. But you have to see it kind of in terms of supply and demand. What the Sacklers did and what Purdue Pharma did and and what a number of other big corporations did was to create an enormous demand for opioids, which then was satisfied, as in the case of Caleb Lanier, by going to other opioids, graduating to heroin and then ultimately to fentanyl. So they created a tremendous demand, which they were fueling by 
providing greater and greater numbers of, 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 of drugs and higher and higher doses. What, what normally created the, uh, the shift to heroin and the fentanyl? Was it that uh, they were so addicted that they were taking so many of these pills that they couldn't afford it anymore? Was that it? That was part of it. And, and there began to be a blowback, too, against overprescribing Oxycontin. Right. So, um, so doctors were nervous about uh, prescribing doses that were too high, right, right. And, and and nervous that they were contributing to to addiction. And at the same time, yeah, there was an expense factor where suddenly, in order to get the same high, you had to keep graduating, you had to titrate up, and you keep graduating up to higher and higher doses. In fact, there's one character in in our film, a guy named Gary Blinn, which is really. Uh, a kind of an astounding character. And this is a, a, a guy we discovered by getting access to some secret documents into a federal investigation. This was a guy who was a former heroin addict who was taking a rather, you know, he went into an office for back pain and there was a Purdue salesperson there who offered to give him Oxycontin for free and ultimately graduated him up to 50 uh, 160 milligram tablets of Oxycontin per day, which is a staggeringly high dose. It was so staggeringly high that he actually kept the pill bottle for 15 years because he was so amazed that anybody would prescribe that amount to him. But what Purdue did with him is there was a sales rep uh, who, by the way, <laughs> was sleeping with the doctor who was prescribing these pills without actually seeing the patient. And And that seemed to be not terribly uncommon the attractive female sales reps there were certainly some in the in in the purdue operation though mm -hmm. you know we talked to some male sales reps but yeah this this woman was a very attractive woman and and as as gary blinn remarked and certainly very attractive to the doctor who was had a relationship with her she then used the enormous doses that they were giving to gary blinn for free as a marketing device. So she would tell other doctors, see, no dose is too high. The one to start with and the one to stay with. Uh, you can prescribe as much as you want for as long as you want, and there won't be any problem. Now, you would think that at home base, if you discovered a salesperson doing this, i.e. sleeping with a doctor and then also prescribing these inhumanly high doses, and, and then and using those doses for marketing purposes, you would think that that person might be reprimanded or fired. Uh, no. In this case, she was promoted to a sales trainer. That gives you some sense of how out of control the culture was at Purdue in terms of just maximizing profits rather than really thinking about the needs of the patient. There's also a sequence where you see people from these uh, lying to insurance, to the insurance people, about why this person was prescribed these things. Oh, yeah. Well, that's INSIS. Now, INSIS, you know, it's one thing to bribe a doctor to prescribe a pill, but then no money really gets to INSIS unless that pill is actually purchased. And that means because they were so expensive and they weren't pills. They, this is this subsist, this fentanyl spray. Mm -hmm. So, you had to get the insurance companies to pay for it. They had a whole operation in Arizona that was designed to basically game the system that insurance companies have. And insurance companies have people they don't want to pay, you know, really knowledgeable people. So they pay people to ask a, a series of standard questions. And this operation uh, of INSIS had gamed those questions and figured out exactly how to lie to these insurance representatives in order to be able to pretend that there was a valid reason for prescribing this medication, like the patient had cancer when the patient didn't have cancer. It was an extremely elaborate fraud operation, but it really was able to take advantage of the enormous weaknesses of our healthcare system which is, uh, after all, you know, designed as a profit-making enterprise, not so much of a Yeah, uh, the insurance healthcare. company is putting people on the phone who can pretty easily be fooled. There's a sequence where <laughs> there's someone from the insurance company is talking to somebody from the Incess. drug company, uh, from Incess, and uh, basically just the person from Incess is going, uh, yeah, uh, uh, 
and it's just a double talk, right? It's double talk, <laughs> and, uh, like, and 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 they know, and and they have charts in front of them. In other words, if it's Blue Cross, these are the kind of lies you need to tell. If it's Amana Health, these are the kinds of lies you need to tell. And we were able to obtain through the prosecutors in the Insys case the actual audio tapes between the Insys fraud team and the various insurance representatives, which we sort yeah, of those are pretty did. stunning. Yeah. Because uh, those are crimes being committed on audio. It also is not humankind at its <laughs> most of At its best. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where are the Sacklers now? Now, they, I, at the end, it seems like everybody's talking about like this $8 billion settlement or something that a lot of communities have made. But there doesn't seem to be $8 billion there anymore. They're not, because what the Sacklers have done is over the years, um, there was a period in the early 2000s when OxyContin, addiction to OxyContin, was ravaging communities all all over America. Uh, There was an enterprising group of uh, U.S. attorneys in Western Virginia that began to investigate the Sacklers and Purdue, because it seemed like all roads were leading to Purdue. And um, they did a pretty good job investigating. And by 2006, they were ready to bring a case and they developed this prosecution memo. It was like a 120 page prosecution memo, which laid out uh, pretty effectively uh, with lots of witnesses. And we were able to obtain a copy of this document, which was otherwise secret. Um, And they were ready to charge uh, key executives at Purdue, very top executives with felonies, hoping to squeeze them to go on on to the top to then ultimately charge the Sacklers who were in charge. But what happened was that um, these very fine prosecutors brought their case to the top of the DOJ. They were discussing these matters. And at that point, Purdue then sent in some very potent figures at the time, a a well-respected gentleman named Rudy Giuliani, who was still fresh off of his um, uh, performance after 9-11, and a woman named Mary Jo White, you know, who's also a well. She, she became head of the SEC, right? Yeah, that's right. And Securities and Exchange Commission. They persuaded people at the top of the Justice Department not to pursue charges uh, or felony charges against the Purdue. And, and a deal was cut in which these executives would plead guilty to misdemeanors. They would be assessed fines, though Purdue would pay those fines and actually pay them even more than that for their trouble. And Purdue itself would plead guilty to a felony as a company, but that really had no valence because no individuals were being held to account. And the company would pay a $600 million fine. Now, that seems like a lot of money at the time, but it was infinitesimal compared to the amount of money that Purdue was generating. But most important of all is that as part of this settlement, all the evidence or almost all of the really important granular evidence was buried. That was part of the deal. In other words, all this evidence you've got against us, some of which and you know, we were able to include in this film because a document was leaked to us many years later. We finally got that prosecution memo. That memo and a lot of the evidence, which would have been presented at trial, was never shown. And so the citizenry and doctors and politicians never got to see the way the crimes were being committed. And as a result, Purdue doubled down on its behavior and all sorts of other companies entered the market to do exactly what Purdue was doing. So it was like, you know, game on. And it was in this period after 2007 that the Sacklers began to start taking money out of Purdue and putting it in their own pockets so that by the time you get to this settlement, which was announced just before, uh, I think in the fall of 2020, that, that Purdue would pay $8 billion. Purdue didn't have $8 billion. Purdue was in bankruptcy. But m- maybe the darkest moment uh, in, the, in the fine print of that settlement was the fact that the way that Purdue was going to pay some of that money, if it could find it, was to manufacture more OxyContin. So to pay for the damage done by OxyContin, it would make more OxyContin. So it it was really a staggeringly awful settlement and and, and didn't really compensate. And, 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 And to this day, the Sacklers have kept 
a fantastic amount of money. You see uh, shots of their estates. Yeah, yes. Pretty, pretty disgusting stuff. Just when Rudy Giuliani was looking pretty good. This, <laughs> this comes out. Well, it's just every rock you turn over, it seems like Rudy Giuliani found a way to hide there. So and he was a, a big spokesperson for Purdue back in the day. Now, was Jamie Gorelick uh, part of this too? I thought Jamie I saw... Gorelick was part of it. Jamie Gorelick, I believe, worked for Wilmer and Hale, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, that's and, right, yeah. and, and, and Wilmer and Hale was, was employed by uh, Cardinal Health. There are three major distributors of drugs. You've never heard of them, but they're massive. Right. Um, they're, they're some of America's largest companies. They're the ones who the manufacturers make the drugs. Cardinal, Marisource, Bergen, and uh, the other one, is, whose name I can't remember, are the ones who distribute it to pharmacies. And one of the things that the Washington Post did, and I should say, in making this film, we, we were aided enormously by a, a, a great group of journalists, a, a group from the Washington Post, Patrick Keefe from The New Yorker, and who also wrote this book on, on the Sacklers called Empire Pain, and uh, Barry Meyer, who was kind of the pioneer uh, journalists who, who really first took on the Sacklers. They were enormously helpful to us. But one of the things that the Post did was to get a hold of this database, which is available to all these companies, which showed where every pill was going. So you think, well, how are they to know? They're selling pills. What are they to know? But they knew where every pill was going. So if you have a small community of 2,000 people and Cardinal is shipping 10 million pills there, you have an idea that it's not all for any yeah, pain. That was a startling figure about how many pills per person in that community they were sending. That's right. Yes, enough for, in one community, enough for every person in the town to have, um, I, I think it was, a, it was something like 360 pills a year uh, for every person in the town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and their cardinals not going like, hey uh, Gus, check this out. Uh, <laughs> you know, Morristown here is getting uh, three hundred and sixty pills per person. Uh, maybe there's a problem here. Yeah, nah. well, that's where. Nah, exactly. That's exactly what it was, and and that gets back to what we were talking about earlier. That's what Joe Renazzisi was trying to stop. He was trying to say, look. If, if you're shipping that many pills to a small town like this, you should know there's a problem. And if we alert you to the fact that there's a problem and you don't do anything about it, we should have the right to shut you down. But that's where that imminent danger versus immediate danger came in. And so suddenly the DEA lost its ability to shut these companies down. And Jamie Gorelick was very much resisting the efforts of people like Joe Renazzisi and others to interfere with the commerce of Cardinal. Well, at least she's not Jewish. <laughs> and neither is Giuliani, so there's that. Well, as, as one person, I remember seeing a film once, said somebody talking about this conspiracy and the Jews are already behind it, and the filmmaker says, well, you know, not Giuliani. He said, what are you talking about? Giuliani. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay, and that guy was Donald Trump. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, boy. Okay, so you're saying that during, of course, during COVID, I guess, people were isolated, and uh, you say the, the use went up. Uh, are, are we on a good curve now? or I, I, I really don't believe we're on a good curve at the moment. I mean, uh, overdoses have increased in the last year, I believe. So no, um, That doesn't sound like it, then. No. So, um, I mean, obviously, uh, interdiction is not going to completely solve that problem. You need, you know, good health care. You need people who have access to treatment. That's one of the things that, you know, communities all over the country are suing, not only Purdue, but also Cardinal, Amerisource Bergen, Johnson & Johnson, and others to get money to uh compensate those communities for the enormous amount of cost for EMT workers, for health care, for drug treatment centers, and so forth and so on. Because so much money has been made off the drugs, wouldn't it be fair to put some of that money back into the communities 
uh, but so far it's it's been kind of a drop in the bucket. Are are there any uh, big cases coming uh, soon? There is moving slowly forward a a, a multi-district litigation, an MDL litigation that's uh, out of Cleveland. And there are also some cases, uh, some local cases in New York and elsewhere. So there are a number of cases. And you'll see... When you say um, multi-jurisdictional, do you mean different states, different cities? Yeah, different states and counties. uh, And and the idea was, and we, we show one small victory from one of those cases, and we show you know, a group of lawyers who are representing a large number of, of, of plaintiffs going to court in, in, in Cleveland, and, and they will occasionally make settlements with large companies on behalf of smaller communities. Uh, that, that litigation is ongoing. So, so there is money there. I there mean- is definitely money there. Uh, the question is, will the penalties fit the crime? And, and, and one of the big problems, which I think really well, needs well, to be looked at. Well, you know what? At, the results of the crime, uh, there's no penalty that can compensate for. Properly. No, no, I agree. Because because that's the one figure we haven't mentioned so far is, that, you know, this is a, when I say crime of the century, 500,000 people died of opiate overdoses in, in the 21st century in America. So that's a pretty big body count. Um, and, a lot, a lot and, of and you're right. Those, no, there's no way of compensating the families whose, whose members are, are, you know, have passed away as a result of this. So yeah, you're right. Well, the thing to do is make it so painful for the companies that they just can't do it anymore, that they won't do it. There's not a, market. and I think you, you have to send some of the executives to jail and, and, yep. and, and just as important, you also have to make sure that when these settlements happen, they don't bury the evidence because it's Mm -hmm. the evidence that lets us see how these crimes are committed and ultimately uh, allows us then the next time around to see that's what happened the last time. We're not going to let this happen again. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was the big crime in 2007. The evidence was buried, which allowed these things to happen over and over and over again. And so sometimes, you know, there's no admission of guilt. And, you know, plaintiff attorneys like to say, well, the money is an admission of guilt. And in some way it is, but in some way it's not. And when you talk to a lot of the victims, what they really want is an accounting. They want the truth to be told. And I think that's more than fair. Yeah. I mean, we we had hearings on this and it is uh, the tragedy. Just reading some of the testimony before even the hearing just uh, tore your heart out. And, uh, no, this is about a lot of suffering, a lot of human suffering. The best thing to do is try to make it stop. That's right. You know, and putting executives in the, in the prison would help make that stop. Yes. That's, Agreed. that's the point of doing that. And then just make it, uh, financially punishing to do something like this would also, uh, would help. Well, thank you for this uh, this film, and it's a two parter, and it's on HBO. Am I correct? Yep, HBO and HBO Max. They have some other good stuff on that, don't they? From time to time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.